I will start again. So uh, we talked about uh, Ibn al-Haytham, now we'll talk about Ibn Sina, uh, one of the most colorful of all the Muslim scientists, and, and he's certainly a giant. And both of these names are giants in, in Islamic history, scientific history, and even in philosophy. Uh, Ibn Sina was born in 980 in uh, Bukhara, or uh, some, a town near Bukhara. So he's from Central Asia. And interestingly, he remained largely in that region, Khorasan, sort of Caspian Sea, in that region. Uh, he, um, he says, he talks about how he, was edu he received education. He says, I studied, I began my study by memorizing the Quran. So I studied, uh, I studied fiqh, like the traditional Islamic sciences. Because when I completed all of that, studying religious sciences, I moved on to philosophy, because I studied all the philosophy of the ancients, the, uh, the, the Aristotle, Plato, the even Muslim, the Al-Kindi and Farabi and so on. Because after that, uh, I turned to medicine, um, and, and in between, you know, he studies uh, maths and, and all of that, logic. Uh, and, and after that, because I studied medicine, because I found medicine the easiest <laughs> out of all of them. Um, uh, he was in comparison to philosophy, it was very easy. Uh, and he goes, then I was uh, 18 years old, basically. <laughs> he was 18 years old when he finished all of that. Uh, imagine reading Aristotle Metaphysics, which is a very hard book, by the way. As I explained earlier, even Ibn Sina finds it very hard. Uh, but he's studying it when he's 15 years old. And then eventually, uh, Farabi's book helps him and he solves much of the mystery or the, the keys that unlocks uh, that philosophy. Um, so he was 18 years old. He becomes a doctor. And, uh, and he was actually recruited by the ruler of the city um, at the age of 17 as a chief physician. So he's a child prodigy. Uh, and, uh, and a polymath as well, a kind of genius. Uh, he, actually, Ibn Sina was a celebrity in his time. He was, he was very famous, and a lot of people really looked up to him, and uh, he was valued as well. And this is what's great about um, um, Muslim scholars. They are always valued, irrespective of their scientists, doctors, or, or the theologians. And, and he, you know, uh, helps people, uh, cure people and treat their illnesses and becomes famous because of that. And he does it all for free, by the way. Uh, uh, that was also another amazing aspect. And um, for instance, one, one time, uh, one of the princes of a, of a local ruler, uh, he goes, has this uh, delusional sort of psychological uh, disorder. He thinks he's a cow. And he, he goes around the palace mooing, and, um, and he goes, slaughter me. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and so they call Ibn Sina, he goes, uh, can you help <laughs> cure him? And he says, okay. So he comes and uh, he comes with a knife. He goes, uh, where is the, uh, the cow that I need, I'm supposed to cure, uh, sorry, I'm supposed to slaughter? He moves and he goes, I'm here. <laughs> and um, so he comes, um, he lays him on the ground, he pretends that he's going to slaughter him. He goes, I can't slaughter this cow, he, he's too skinny. And, and one thing that he wasn't eating, because he goes, I don't need to slaughter him, and he doesn't eat. Um, and he goes, uh, you got to eat first, you know, fatten up, then I'm going to come back and slaughter you. He says, all right. So he starts eating this prison, and that actually helps him, and he starts, to, he cures himself after a while. So he successfully, <laughs> using uh, psychology, you know, reverse psychology, he cures the uh, prince. So all these stories make him very famous and, and sought after physician for the local emirs or rulers. Um, but also, uh, when, and when he becomes a doctor of uh, Nuh the second, the one of the last uh, Samanid rulers, uh, he has a massive library, and uh, he 
reads all the books. So he really excels in all sorts of knowledge. Um, and when, uh, after a few years, there's a fire burns the library, so all the books are lost. Some of uh, Ibn Sina's enemies say that he burnt the library himself. He read all the books, he took the knowledge. To prevent anyone else gaining that knowledge, <laughs> he burnt the library. This is, they spread a rumor like that. Uh, of course, it wasn't true. Uh, so, uh, Ibn Sina's uh, kind of professional life is a bit, goes a lot of ups and downs. Uh, one of the key characteristics of people like him, they need patronage. And this is their life, they do this full time. And, uh, and unless they are supported uh, through patronage, um, they, may not, uh, they may not practice what they're doing. And being a doctor, they're also sought after as well. So one ruler after another uh, called him, and that's, this is a bit of a turbulent time as well, with Samanids losing their power, others coming in. So, and when you're the doctor of a, of a ruler, a mir, and he loses battle to someone else, then he becomes a target by virtue of being in his court. So he escapes death, you know, quite a few times. Uh, and, he's, uh, and he can do that mainly because it's his native town, he, he, uh, he has friends and some family, they sort of protect him and so on. Uh, the Mahmud the Ghaznavi invites him to his court, he doesn't go. This is a bit of a speculation why he doesn't go. Um, but I think uh, one of the main reason could be that he was in a totally different region. And if he was in trouble, what's he going to do? It's kind of a very, he could be in trouble. So he, he preferred to stay in his native region. But this doesn't mean that his books were spread across the Muslim world. Um, there are 450 uh, books attributed to Ibn Sina. 450, 240 survived, sort of different in length. Um, 150 on philosophy and 40 on medicine. But he's got two of them are very famous. Um, and one of those is uh, what we call the uh, Kanun um, uh, fi, fi Tib. Kanun, kanun fi Tib. Kanun means canon, like law. Uh, laws of medicine, basically. You could translate it as that. Um, and this, uh, this particular book was extremely important because it had five volumes and it was taught as a textbook in uh, much of the world at that time for five centuries. So until uh, 1650 it was taught in European universities as the main book of medicine. Even today, they say that in India, there's, you know, as alternative medicine, it's still practiced in some parts. Uh, the, the book is alive. So only until uh, they, there's some new discoveries or better texts are produced. They, were, they weren't very different, maybe they were written better uh, by various other physicians and scientists. Um, uh, but it, really medicine as we know it, the modern medicine revolutionizes in the beginning of 19th century when they discover bacteria, you know, with the microscopes and so on. It just totally changes how you perceive diseases and so on. <clears throat> so the contribution of this book was, uh, it was the repository of all medical knowledge available in one text, or, you know, five volumes. Uh, the, you did not have to study anything else. So gallons, medical books, any other, he sort of collected them all, used his own discoveries and you know, uh, 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 what not, and, and produced this clear and well-structured work uh, that was easy to read and understand. A lot, of, a lot of it is wrong. I mean, just because it was studied doesn't make it right. Uh, because, you know, he's working with the knowledge of his time. Like, just like today, we are discovering new things all the time and you update your knowledge and that's what Ibn Sina was doing. 
Um, the, work, uh, the first one, in the first volume he talks about, it's called Kulliyat. He talks about how human body works, um, how sickness works, you know, how to diagnose sickness and cure it. I mean, all of these are still relevant and very much um, valued. And then the second one, he lists 800 ingredients where you can use to make drugs and their properties. And that's, that, it's like an encyclopedia of pharmacy as well. Um, in the third volume, he talks about uh, from head to toe, all the known diseases. The, what they're called, how you can diagnose it, and how you can, uh, what are the certain cures that are prescribed in his time. Um, uh, and, and he looks at each one separately, you know, like the nose, the, the eye, and each different body parts and organs. His fourth volume looks at uh, what he calls diseases that affect the whole body, like fever and uh, like the or systems of organs, uh, because it's not just the one, the, the nose or the ear or something, it's collection of the body. And the last, uh, last volume has 650 drugs or medicines that can be uh, put together using the ingredients in the second volume. And, and what are they used for? So it was a fantastic uh, book of medicine. And it's really unfortunate because that you would lose that as a Muslim civilization because the book of medicine that was taught in schools or institutions in the Muslim world was re in 19th century reduced to 250 pages of book. Unfortunately, so it was simplified. Instead of going forward, Muslims went uh, a little bit backwards. He has a, another book, Kitab as Shifa. It sounds like a, a book of healing. It's sort of translated. It sounds like a medicine book, but it's not. And this was meant to be healing for the man, a soul of human beings. And it's about you know understanding the world, the universe, and so on. So it's a book of theology, uh, metaphysics, and philosophy. And a lot of his philosophical ideas are put in this work. Um, they say that he, he published Kitab al-Shifa, um, a Kanun al in 1025. Uh, and uh, two years later, Kitab al-Shifa came out. He published it. But probably he was writing it you know, throughout uh, much of the, the, his life. Um, you know, he, talks about, he, he talks about a broad range of topics in his Kitab al-Shifa, and one of those is, um, he talks about how mountains could have originated. Now this was very different to his the understanding of his time. Basically people thought, oh, well, it was just created. And he discussed some processes that would have produced mountains. Um, he, he talked about, he proved that Venus was closer to Earth than the Sun. Uh, and also he talked about how fossils could be produced. Like fossils were known uh, even in Aristotle's time uh, and how they could be produced. Sort of Ibn Sina said that he called it a petrification, a process of petrification where he says something must have happened like an earthquake or a sudden event which would have buried you know, living beings and then fluids from their body would come out, uh, so you'd have the form, but it becomes a stone, basically, like petrified. Um, so these are some of his uh, ideas and contributions. Um, he, he talks about, um, <clears throat> you know, just like you have five senses, you know, you're touching, seeing, hearing, uh, you know, touching, seeing, hearing, taste, and smell. He talked about, he, this is his contribution, five inner senses. And these were like uh, uh, intellect, uh, imagination, instinct, and, uh, and he called uh, intentions and perception. So these were five inner senses uh, he talked about. Um, he defined uh, uh, depression as a psychological disorder, for instance. 
and he tried to cure it with the medication. Um, I mean, he's philosophical, I don't want to get into the philosophy, but he's got some interesting, uh, I, I, I have to tell you this one, uh, because it's very famous. Uh, what he called it is the, a thought experiment. You know, thought experiment where to prove the existence of the soul, the human spirit, he said, imagine that a human being is created in one go, so, so that he doesn't grow, and he's suspended in void, not held by anything, and uh, it's dark so that he cannot see anything, and his limbs are stretched out, like even his fingers, where he cannot touch anything. So basically all sense perception not, is non-existent. Would he still know his existence? And his answer is yes. He would still say, I exist. He was, he was, to him, that proves the existence of spirit. Um, because, because in his time, uh, there was all these theories about uh, the soul, the human soul, being dependent on physical objects. So he was trying to prove that it's not dependent. Um, and one, uh, he sort of located the human spirit in the heart. I mean, there's all these different theories about where the spirit is located. Ibn al-Nafis, who's another Muslim scientist, he actually talks about, no, it's not in a location, it's the entirety of the body. Because your ability to say, I am, is, um, um, is what's the spirit. Actually, this, that suspended uh, man experiment, this is what uh, Descartes, centuries later, his famous, you know, I think, therefore I am, idea comes from that. And even sort of scholars debated, are they different? And they say, well, it's exactly the same. So we don't know whether Descartes learned that from Ibn Sina, but this was a, probably he was. Uh, but he expressed it a little bit differently. Um. Um, and he, uh, Ibn Sina, uh, sometimes Ibn Sina is criticized by, I mean, next week we'll touch on Imam Ghazali. Uh, Imam Ghazali criticized him, or his philosophy, we should say. Uh, but Ibn Sina is a genuine Muslim. Like, he really truly believed. He's, he talked about supremacy of the Quran, uh, and, uh, you know, and he was a genuine Muslim, he practiced Islam. So there's no problem there, but obviously he was trying to explain existence. You know, why does the universe exist the way it is? How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how does God create things and govern the universe uh, uh, from an unseen world? So all these were problems that he tried to address through building a cosmology that was a combination of theology and philosophy at the same time. Uh, you know, he wasn't attempting to write about theology, he was just trying to explain uh, the world, the universe, in connection with assuming that it is the product of God. Um, and in his time uh, also, there was no distinction between science and philosophy, as I mentioned, uh, or science and religion, they all assumed knowledge was one. Um, so his philosophical explanations are extremely important. It influenced Thomas, uh, Thomas Aquinas, who's a very important Christian theologian, which actually he started a whole new scholastic movement in Christian theology. Uh, he's not the only influence of uh, Thomas Aquinas, also learned from Ibn Rushd, uh, as well as you know, Aristotle and so on. Um, and, and even um, his ideas on theory of knowledge and psychology, uh, he influenced Albertus Magnus, who's another important Western cleric and, and, and scholar and a philosopher as well. So uh, he has a massive influence. He, he wrote on the logic. Uh, he studied logic. Uh, Arist he completely changed Aristotle logic. He introduced his own uh, Avicennian, it's called Avicennian logical system. 
which was actually incorporated in the, into madrasa training. So he, uh, he's got this massive influence in the, in the world. So he's a, he's a giant of a figure. Like even though, um, and he's got this, uh, we, uh, the letters that he exchanged with uh, Al-Biruni. Now Al-Biruni is also a giant of a scholar and he's writing to Ibn Sina asking some really serious questions and he expects, he wants to know what his answers are. And this is, uh, he sends him a list of 18 questions. And some of these questions are like, for example, why does, uh, why does uh, if, uh, let's say, the planets uh, go around the Earth, this is, this is what they thought, why doesn't the planet uh, either escape from that orbit or fall into Earth? Like, why are they always fixed? He's just wondering why. And secondly, he says, how does, another question, um, how does the heat from the sun come to Earth? Is it through some physical means or some other means? Uh, you can see the, how sophisticated the questions are. And the thirdly, uh, another question is, um, why does Ibn Sina dis disagree with Aristotle's uh, atomic theory? Because, you know, there was a theory about atoms, oh, sorry, the things made up of atoms or it could be reduced to this invisible building blocks where everything was made of, which we know now today as atoms. Um, but there was an alternative theory, which was you could actually divide matter in, a, in, in an infinite way, infinitely into smaller parts. This is what Ibn Sina talked about. Um, Al-Burini had trouble with that, and he was asking, why can't you accept uh, the atoms uh, because they're equally speculative. You're also... Spe uh, actually, the, the existence of atoms in science, even in science, this idea of uh, infinite divisibility of matter was accepted until Einstein proved the existence of atoms. And one of the first contributions of Einstein was he proved uh, uh, the atoms exist and he calculated the size. But now we know, after years of particle physics, Atoms are not the smallest particles, they are smaller than that. And then uh, every time they build a bigger accelerator and you know, those, uh, they collide protons and atoms, they're producing smaller and smaller particles. Now there is this thing called string theory. That there are even smaller things than particles. <clears throat> well, it's still, yet it's not proven or accepted as fact but they're working on it. So who's right? We don't know. Like, <laughs> yes, atoms exist, but <clears throat> it seems that you can even divide atoms to smaller and smaller particles. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, one of the answers, I mean, obviously we can't go through all these answers, but he, uh, Ibn Sina answers uh, about the heat that the sun, he says, um, uh, the heat does not come from or descend from the sky, but the light descends. But when light hits the earth, atmosphere, that produces heat in a, in a process of you know, collisions. And, and uh, wrongly, he said, the, the sun is not hot. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, he's got a line of reasoning and, and sort of uh, he, he provides evidence. Um, but because he said, if there was a, if heat was to come, it had to come through a medium, and that would mean that, uh, and, but we don't observe that. For instance, he gave evidence of what they call burning glass, you know, the lenses where you can hold the sun uh, and then you can burn something. He says, but the light doesn't burn, but when, when it goes through another medium, it starts burning. So that, to him, the atmosphere was acting like a lens, producing heat. So it sort of made sense. But Alberini doesn't accept it, and he, goes, he starts writing back, you know, with objections. And after a while, uh, Ibn Sina gets a little bit angry. He passes to his, his student to give answers. And his student talks about, 
have you read what the wise one has replied before? <laughs> you know, kind of, they're getting irritated. Uh, I mean, uh, Ibn Sina had a lot of students. He always, they studied with him. As I said, he was a genius and celebrity. Um, and so Al-Biruni is a, is a giant. He's, I just want to tell you about him and then I'll, I'll finish with an anecdote and, and we'll finish for t today. And maybe uh, you, you can ask questions. Um, Al-Biruni calculated the radius of the Earth just with two measurements. Now prior to Al-Biruni, uh, they actually calculated the there was one, there was a couple of ways of calculating the size of the Earth or the radius. One of them was you take two cities and you measure, you know, the celestial latitudes, like the angle that they make with in re reference to the circle, uh, and then you step by step, you know, work out the distance between two cities, and using those two figures, you can estimate. Uh, the size of the Earth, using, you know, mathematics. But, you know, I mean, how accurate is it going to be, your steps? <laughs> your meter, you know, you take one. Uh, but they did it, uh, they did it in uh, Roman times. And then uh, in um, House of Wisdom, uh, actually this was one of the projects that Caliph al-Mamun gave to al-Kindi and the scholars, scientists to work out the circumference of Earth. And they did a different method, but it was still relying on, it was more accurate, but it still relied on measuring distances between cities. Um, what al Bayrini did was amazing. He, what he did was, he went on top of a mountain and uh, took, made a big, uh, uh, those angle measuring devices, you know. He sort of held it up, he measured the angle to the horizon. So that gives you one angle. Then he, uh, he went a certain distance from the base of the mountain to, let's say, 200 meters, and measured from that 200 meters uh, to the top of the hill, where he took the first measurement from. He measured that angle as well. That gives you two triangles within one another, those measurements. And from that, you can work out the height of the mountain accurately. And then, uh, like the mountain, uh, that angle sort of make a bigger angle with the center of the earth, bigger uh, triangle. And from that, using just basic trigonometry, you can work out the radius of the earth. It's ingenious uh, method. And it, it was close to like 99.9% or something uh, accurate. So he's al Bayruni. Actually, sort of uh, Jim Khalili says, uh, out of all the Muslim scientists, Muslim scientists, his favorite one is al Biruni. If he would give the award of the best scientist to him. Um, but Ibn Sina didn't think so, and, and, and they had a bit of a... Oh, he was maybe frustrated. I'm explaining to him, and he's, not, he's always coming back with these answers. Um, so as great as... Uh, Ibn Sina was, he, he was humble, he was a humble person. And, uh, and one day, one of his students said, you're so intelligent, you're so great, you're a genius. If you were to declare your prophethood, I mean, not, to, not that he would, but he's just explaining how great he is, people would believe you. And Ibn Sina doesn't answer him. And uh, some sort of months pass. He's just waiting for the right moment. And one day in the middle of winter, sort of uh, his student, uh, he, he, wakes up his, he wakes his student up, sort of towards the morning, sort of fajr time. He says, can you get me water, please? He goes, no, he's, um, he's sleepy. He doesn't want to get up. He gives excuses and procrastinates. Yeah, I'll get up as soon as and then sleeps. <laughs> Um, and right at that moment, a muezzin calls the azan. And the student just jumps up from his bed and uh, wakes up and starts having ablution. And, 
Um, and then he stops and he goes, now can you see why I, I'm not as great as a prophet? Because I couldn't wake you up. You've been my student for years and benefited from me. Um, and uh, and you, you wouldn't even get water from, for me. But the prophet, peace be upon him, from 400 years away, <laughs> You know, this call to prayer that he taught, uh, and with that signal, you're getting up. Because that's a prophet, and this is me, you know. Um, we will never be equal. Uh, so, I, I mean, that's a great lesson, isn't it? Isn't it? And it also shows the greatness of the, of the man. Uh, because sometimes, uh, I mean, certain books, when you write it, they write that philosophers, Muslim philosophers like Al Kindi, Farabi, or Ibn Sina, they made uh, philosophers higher than prophets or as such. These are not true, you know. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, they may have talked about, uh, I mean, obviously, the faculty of intelligence in some people are just heightened and great. Um, uh, and prophets are also intelligent, but they're talking to ordinary people. They're not going to philosophize things. Um, and uh, he led a fast life, and when they asked him, when his friends said to him, look, you've got to slow down, you're always you're moving too fast, working hard, producing books, getting in trouble with rulers, um, and uh, you slow down. He, go, he said, well, I'd rather live a short life, but with width, like with breath, rather than live, uh, leading a long but narrow life. Yes, uh, I'd rather do that. And he died at the age of 57. Uh, pretty young for a person, uh, in, or in our today's standards. Uh, but considering that he, was, he started practicing medicine at the age of 17, but he's been around for 40 years, that's a very productive life, and he produced great works. So may God uh, give mercy to their souls, and enable us to learn from them, and learn from their examples. The, uh, you know, if you don't put discipline to this type of work, uh, with knowledge, yes, you need the brains, you need that genius, um, but how do you know you don't have it? How do you know you don't have it? And um, maybe you do, but you don't apply yourself. Too lazy, you know, not enough discipline. So, like, we've got to read, we've got to study, and be curious about knowledge. Like, one of the great things about Muslim scientists and scholars, they're really curious about knowledge and curious about questions. Like, why does, yeah, why doesn't these uh, objects fall onto Earth? Why do they always go in circles? Like, El Burini is driving him crazy. If he lived in our time, he'd be stuck in library, like, absorb this knowledge. We're so lucky. You can now see the moon and the earth from the outside of, they never had that opportunity. So, um, we'll leave it there, hopefully. Uh, I hope that was enough, you know. Uh, maybe if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, so I can, uh, you mentioned that he defined um, depression as psychological or disorder, and he spoke about his cure. What cure? Did he actually talk about uh, I don't from, know. from a person who has depression? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, look, uh, the the medicine in those times were largely related to what Ibn Sina called, he even the sort of defined medicine as the art of or the knowledge of what makes you healthy and what makes you not healthy and then bring you into that healthy state. Which is pretty good, not too bad. Um, but sort of since Galen, sort of Galen uh, was that Roman sort of uh, medical doctor, he wrote extensively, they call these uh, humors in the body, sort of liquids in the body, that they said that uh, they're responsible for cure, uh, illness and cure as well. Like, for example, uh, if you have fever in the body, it meant that you had, you had too much blood. You have to let blood out. So bloodletting comes from that. Um, and the, 
yeah, so uh, there was an imbalance in the liquids and humors, so uh, you, you had to do something. Uh, so some of these few sort of medicines were of that nature, or cures that was prescribed. But what's important with Ibn Sina's Karna Tip is that for the first time he's combining not only a diagnose, like how to diagnose disease, but what is a disease, how do you diagnose it, how do you identify it, and, and the pharmacy knowledge, all in one. So pharmacy, cure. Actually, after that, and, and when they built hospitals, they had a pharmaceutical sections in Muslim hospitals. And they even had, for example, when you went into a hospital, they took off your clothes, they gave you new clothes. That's what they do today, don't they, in hospitals? Because you can bring maybe some sickness with you with those clothes. Uh, they kept their records uh, of patient information and they have different wards for different diseases. Uh, this was like the hospital, the modern hospital we have today. Uh, they cure the mental diseases usually with the music and water and this kind of things. Um, but in terms of, uh, like, uh, even though the, perhaps the medicine practiced by Muslims were not advanced in today's standards and it didn't always cure it, but it was still far advanced for its time. Like for example, they talk about these um, crusades. When crusades came, there's a, a writer, a Muslim doctor, writes about his experiences with crusades. So he's called to, to these cases where this woman has this headache and, uh, and a guy has a, a wound in his leg. Uh, so he, the Muslim doctor comes and he, he looks at it, he, he gives some medicine. He goes, try this, and if you don't, if it doesn't cure you, come back, call me back. This is what doctors do today, <laughs> the GPs, you know, uh, try this medicine, and if it doesn't work, come back a week later. And uh, you're always questioning, are they calling me for real, to, so that they can make more money, or am I seriously needed to come? Um, but, uh, but the Crusades, they don't like this particular diagnosis, they go, this is not medicine. So they try to, they, they practice what they know from back in Europe. So what they do is, um, the woman who has the headache, they slit uh, the incision in the form of a cross in her forehead, take the skin out, rub salt, and uh, push it. <laughs> and uh, the man, they uh, chop his leg off. Uh, both of them die, of course. And the, and the Muslim doctor says, uh, I mean, he's describing how sort of he finds that quite really vulgar and quite bad or, or backward in terms of medicine. So in relation to what others did at the time, Muslim doctors were far more advanced. Um, uh, but uh, they didn't always get it right. Um, I just want to know, like these days, coming from a pharmacy background, we always separate modern medicine mm. to traditional and sort of more spiritual, sort of like holistic approach. But you said Ibn Sina had knowledge as one and he tied, how did he manage to tie the physical, the medicine, the whole diagnosis with the whole holistic approach quite successfully? Uh, it wasn't always successful, but <laughs> as I said, the thing is the, the underlying assumption is that uh, today's medicine does not take into account God and metaphysics and spirit. Even in psychology, you know, sort of psychology is all about neurotransmitters in the brain or uh, take lithium tablets, it's going to cure you. Uh, I mean, that is, sure, surely it does, it changes, it, it does help in some cases. Uh, but if you don't take into account um, spiritual side, then something is missing. Uh, and this is what Ibn Sina actually talks about, how spirit can influence the body and how body can influence the spirit. Like your mood, your positive mood and belief, um, even if it's sometimes pseudo 
remedy, like it, but still inf impacts on the physical body. But whereas, when, whereas if you're depressed about your illness, you think you're gonna die, we all know that it, it can make it worse. Like they, I was, somebody told me from a hospital, there was a Russian man, uh, like, like the doctors always, uh, when someone has cancer, they always have this dilemma, should we tell them, shouldn't we tell them? And because if you tell them, it, may, it can get worse. If you don't tell them, they have a right to know. Uh, and um, they told this Russian man that he, was going, he has cancer, and wants to live, he died in three days. Like, uh, it, because that just that knowledge of, oh, I'm going to die, really depressed him and just sickness uh, so accelerated so fast that it, he died. So I think that, that idea of um, your psychology influencing your mental state and your mental state inf affecting your psychology, your spiritual side, that ultimately, you know, uh, remedy comes from God. Like uh, all of that, obviously you c people can, there are people in our time now who refuse to take medication or go to a doctor, they're believing that God will cure them if they pray hard enough or sincerely. Uh, certainly that is possible, but it's like uh, they say in uh, his theological books, they asked, uh, a devil appeared before Jesus and, uh, and said, can you throw, throw yourself off the cliff, see if you're going to die or not? And Jesus says, peace be upon him, as I can't do that, that's like testing God. Because God tests his servants, but we cannot test God. So it's like uh, you, you're testing God. Like, I'm going to pray hard enough and God, you have to cure me. Well, that's not right. Uh, like the prophet said, there's a cure, like material ingredients that are required for the curing to take place. Uh, and uh, all doctors do basically is put it all together, optimize the conditions that produces the healing effect. But ultimately, healing is creative. Just to let you know, like, you know, when you cut yourself, let's say, a nerve cuts, you know, and then doctors stitch it together, that's it. Just put the two flesh together and your job is done. And just leave three weeks, it'll be all right. Doctors don't actually cure that healing process. It's all there in the body. Like you know how nerves meet? Apparently, if there's a bundle of nerves cut, what happens is when you put the two bundles together, the right nerve has to connect with the right nerve because you don't know, you're not going to fully align it. So what happens is a nerve puts tentacles, like offshoots, multiple offshoots to different nerves. When it finds the right one, everything else gets uh, d detached. Amazing stuff, like how do you, how do you get that? And so, uh, so these are the kind of things. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, but obviously there's argument for and against these things. Uh, it's never cut dry. And, and eventually it goes back to cause and effect. It does really cause and effect exist. And what does causes really do? And, you know, uh, like what we perceive as six causes, are they really that? Like if I, for instance, um, let's uh, assume that, you know, in this screen at the back here, there is a being on that two-dimensional world. Um, and, uh, and that being, uh, he doesn't see me because I'm in the three-dimensional world. And I have a, have a gun in my hand and I just walk across this here at a constant speed while fire, pulling the trigger, which will fire bullets, and the bullets will put holes into the screen. Now, you know, I know that it's just cr those holes are created by bullets. But the, um, the guy on that screen, living in that screen, these just holes appear out of nowhere. And, uh, and then he says, wow, wait a minute. Uh, the first hole appeared, and, and then a second later, another hole appeared. So this hole must have caused that hole. And then, so on and on. 
So he forms a causal relationship between the... Well, we know that that's not true. That he is just... Maybe what we observe as cause and effect is just like God doing things behind the three, four-dimensional world in which we live in, uh, and, uh, and then we just perceive it this way. Uh, there's actually uh, there's this M theory which suggests that the existence is made up of 11 dimensions. And we are only perceiving in four dimensions. And it's mathematically these things are proven, but obviously how do you perceive? The actually string theory is built on this 11th dimensional world. Um, I mean that, that sort of supports that metaph metaphysical realm, what we call metaphysics could be different dimensions of existence. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. I mean, there, there is a, apparently there's some neural circuitry in your heart. Like the, it's has independent neurons or brain in the heart, which is independent of the brain, but it's connected. So your spiritual state can influence your heart which can influence your brain and your mental state. And same, if you have a positive mental state, it can improve your heart. You know, sometimes <coughs> when, you, when people are depressed, they feel their heart constricting, really. And when you have a spiritual experience, you feel your heart expanding. So there is that connection of some reason. I have a question. Yes, please. Even though I'm not supposed to. But... No, you please, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so what happened? All this wonderful science, scientists oh, okay. came okay. out of the Muslim world, great civilization, influenced Europe, Renaissance. Yeah. What happened? What, what happened, happened to all the science? Why can't the Muslim world produce one single yes. scientist? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, long weekend, yeah. We've got a long weekend. There's another lecture on that. Well, just in a nutshell, it continued. Like, it continued beyond 12th century. Uh, there's George Saliba has investigated and he's written on this. He's got a number of books. He actually says that it continued, but in different places. What happened was the house of or Beitul Hikmah. <coughs> By the way, uh, that mad caliph uh, Al-Hakim built Darul Hikmah in Cairo. It was going to rival Beitul Hikmah. Um, but in, 12, in 1258, Baghdad was destroyed with Beitul Hikmah, the house of wisdom, by the Mongol invasions. Like Mongols wreaked havoc across Central Asia, Bukhara, Samarkand, all these massive the places where Al Buruni, uh, Ibn Sina were raised. They uh, raised it through the ground. They never recovered those regions. Baghdad never recovered fully. Uh, but these uh, some of these centers of learning moved to Syria. Uh, a Maghara sort of a revival, there is another Central Asian revival that happens. Uh, Uluh Bey, for example, is a famous uh, astronomer that comes into Ottoman Sultan uh, Mehmed, who conquered Constantinople. He calls them in, they build a university and so there is this uh, revival, but uh, it's never the same, and, but uh, for example, Sicily is destroyed, Sicily is captured. A lot, these were all centers of learning. Uh, in Spain, in 1492, Granada is lost, finally. Uh, I mean, the Spanish Reconquista, uh, who captured Toledo, for example, they were smart, they didn't burn the libraries, like in other cities others did. They started a translation process like Palermo, Toledo, like in Sicily, from southern Italy, uh, Spain, all this reverse translation movement starts. So Muslims are losing all that knowledge and Europeans are taking it. Um, and in Europe, for example, they established uh, universities for the first time. What universities was this? Because all, all higher learning was controlled by the church and church did not want this, they called it Arab science, uh, Arab knowledge, so all these scholars who were learning this, they established their own institutions, universities, uh, which really, you know, produce, uh, and over time, I mean, Europe slowly, it didn't happen very quickly, over three centuries, 
really Europe caught up to the Muslim world, while Muslim world going in a slow decline. Uh, one of the last attempts uh, was made to revive science with building of uh, this observatory in Istanbul by Sokulu Mehmet Pasha, uh, who was the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire for 15 years. This man was amazing. Uh, he was he was a genius, and uh, I, I'm almost contemplating writing a book about him. He was that. Uh, he did some amazing things. So, for example, he wanted to build Suez Canal, and um, but this, it wasn't just feasible with the technology of that time. Uh, and and he established this uh, observatory in 1577 in uh, Istanbul. And uh, he, what was it, Takiuddin uh, Tusi? Uh, yeah, he he was the main person in charge, Al Tusi. And this is at the same time as Tycho Brahe builds his observatory in Europe, which kind of revolutionizes astronomy in Europe. But three years later, I mean, Sokolu Mehmet Pasha dies in uh, like 1579. And a year later, they destroyed the observatory. Uh, by some uh, religious uh, bigots. And unfortunately, these were some major scholarly or like clerical uh, uh, figures in Istanbul. They, they, uh, one of the big issues, uh, or these kind of religious figures had big issues with astronomy, saying that astronomy was about astrology. And they thought astrology is haram, you know. And uh, so, for them, it was better to destroy. Uh, and, and it was, uh, it just killed, uh, you know, when you just think about it. And it was never built after that uh, in, a, in any part of the Muslim world. No new observatory was built until some modern times. Uh, the, um, the printing press came 200 years late in the Muslim world because all the scribes who had jobs, they thought they were going to lose their jobs. And people objected on the grounds of theology. Once again, oh, you, can, you know, Arabic letters are holy letters. You cannot write it by a machine. You have to write it by hand. You know, all, uh, and even when uh, later, there's another, another book, the predecessor of uh, Sokulu Mehmet Pasha, uh, what's his name? Uh, Koja Sinan Pasha, he's also a visionary, and he commissions a book. Uh, it's called uh, Tarihi uh, Gharbi Hindi, the, the history of the West Indies, where they talk about how Spanish and the Portuguese are you know, exploring the world in America and in Indian Ocean, uh, and, uh, and that they, they need to build the Suez Canal. This was the second attempt to build Suez Canal. The whole, that whole book is about justifying the building of Suez Canal. And interestingly, they, they, uh, on th they sort of defend the building of the canal on theological grounds, or sort of anticipating some theological objections to building of the canal. Like, what would, why would, what, how is it linked to theology? But they, they feel the need to do that. So that shows that there is a, this a bigoted uh, presence of uh, that bigotry where, where uh, this is haram, don't do that, that's not good, this is not good. Uh, like uh, they don't know about science and they fear, fear it. And they, so this has really declined the Muslim world, unfortunately. And actually, um, and I don't want to cut into the uh, Al Ghazali. But Al-Ghazali, the, the madrasas that he established kind of also took knowledge as one whole, but 200 or so years later, uh, some more conservative people, when they took charge, they removed all science from the madrasas. So they started producing all these people who just studied religion, and as uh, Said Nursi said, if you study uh, Science without religion, it produces disbelief. 
But if you study religion without science, it produces bigotry. So only when you combine the two, wisdom prevails. Hikmah, you know, the wisdom comes out. That's why Dar, uh, House of Wisdom, it was called. Uh, uh, and it always happens, like it's not just in the Muslim world, you see it everywhere. Uh, the religious bigotry is a big problem, but also, you know, separating religion or theology from science is also a big problem. Maybe the world needs the revival of this uh, house of wisdom again, inshallah.